Good morning uh, and welcome to Global Neurosciences Institute uh, Grand Rounds and Happy New Year, everybody. And now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce our uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Borna Bornagdapur. Dr. Borna Bornagdapur is a faculty member of the Northwestern Meslem Center for Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Center and an assistant professor of neurology at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine Department of Neurology. He received his medical degree from Tehran University of Medical Sciences with a minor in music and piano performance. His doctoral research on melodic intonation therapy for stroke aphasia received international attention and brought him to Northwestern University for his research fellowship in aphasia rehabilitation and neuroimaging of language. Following that, he finished his residence in neurology at the University of Arizona and then completely completed a Florine and Jerome Rosenstone Cognitive Neurology Fellowship at the Messalum Center. He is board certified in neurology and behavioral neurology and a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology. His research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health to study language breakdown in neurodegenerative diseases and by the National Endowment for the Arts to study the effects music intervention in dementia. Dr. Purnagdapur will be speaking today about primary progressive aphasia. Dr. Purnagdapur. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Glybus, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for having me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the language network and the brain and uh, a rare type of uh, mm -hmm. aphasia, primary progressive aphasia. The, the most common type of aphasia is what we see in stroke patients. But today we're going to talk about primary progressive aphasia, the state of research, and what we've learned through PPA that uh, has increased our understanding of language network and also management of um, language disorders. Um, I have many conflicts, none of them are of interest, and here are my, I, my funding resources. So. Um, this is an outline of what I'm going to be talking today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the language network localization and its uh, evolving uh, research and challenges over years. Then I'll give you a little bit of background about functional imaging of language network and how we are studying the physiology uh, and anatomy of language network. And then I'll talk to you about assessment of language. Uh, mostly the language assessment has been based on stroke uh, related aphasias, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of um, insight uh, about how we do that in neurodegenerative diseases like uh, primary progressive aphasia. I'll talk to you a little bit about PPA and about the research we've been doing during the past eight to 10 years, uh, and then what the implications are for therapeutic interventions. So, um, the story of language networks, of course, starts with, with uh, Paul Broca, 1865, where he described his patient, Monsieur Tong, who had a uh, lesion in the inferior frontal gyrus. As you see, the brain is still available in France. And then later, the, the German physiologist, Wernicke, in 1874, Broca's patient had difficulty with expression of language. Wernicke didn't understand um, language, couldn't communicate because of lack of comprehension. So there was this notion of expression is in the anterior part of the brain and, and uh, comprehension the posterior. And then later, um, based on the work that Lichtheim and later Geschwind did, these are very key figure, figures in uh, physiology. Lichtheim for the first time described the connection between the Broca's and Wernicke's area through the what we know now arcuate fasciculus. So the the, um, the pattern of language anatomy at that time was pretty simple and then the, uh, if you look at the left uh, um, diagram you see that and even at that time he uh, described an area B, which we know that it's, it's now uh, anterior frontal areas in the premotor and uh, anterior frontal uh, cortices that uh, can have actually top to bottom control of the language network. And then based on what Geschwind 
uh, described later, you see the language network is now growing, you know, to involve the sensory and motor areas. So, um, but things were too simple at that time. Um, when Nina Dronkers went to France in uh, 2006 and did a MRI of the, the Broca's patient's brain, you'll see things changed. The lesion was not really only in the frontal, frontal lobe or inferior frontal gyrus. As you see in, in the sections down here, uh, and left is left in these pictures in these axial cuts. You see there were a lot of white matter damage also because of the underlying cause that caused the stroke. And I think it was syphilitic lesion in the brain. So that changes things. If we said production of language and grammar is all in the anterior part of the brain, well, that doesn't really explain it here because uh, that means that the patient had also a lot of uh, decreased connectivity to the posterior aspects of the brain. And now um, with the modern uh, neuroimaging, including functional MRI with the, with the, uh, with the morphometry and also tractography, looking at the tracts. Now we know there are at least three different wide matter tracts that are involved in connectivity between different regions of the language network. You see the arcuate fasciculus and superior longitudinal fasciculus in orange here. This is based on Stephen Wilson's work. And uh, so that is, it involves processing of grammar and also phonology. So putting letters together to, to say a word and putting the words together to create a sentence. So that will be the orange and yellow, the orchid, fasciculus, and SLF. But um, language processing has completely another aspect and that's processing of single words and semantics which is processed through the, what, what is called the ventral pathway. The other pathway is called the dorsal pathway. The, the ventral pathway here, uh, an important tract is uh, external capsule fasciculus. You see in uh, blue and green. So that involves processing of words and, and processing at the lexical level. And then you have the onsenet fasciculus, which, which connects the, te the temporal pole to, to the frontal areas and then completes this loop. And this is a nice uh, depiction of the language network uh, by Frederici and Gearham. And then you see, uh, so aside from the superior frontal, uh, superior temporal gyrus, the, the green area where, you know, we thought the Wernicke's area was located, there is also the middle temporal gyrus. And Wernicke's area is really, it's been changing its position, its location over time. And so it's really the posterior part of both superior temporal and middle temporal gyri. And, um, and then you see the Broca's area here, the four areas 44, 45, that hasn't changed much. And then we have two tracts here connecting them dorsally, the arcuate and the superior longitudinal fasciculus, that one goes to the, the premotor and prefrontal areas, the other one directly to the Broca's area. And then you, you see the ventral pathways. So that's really the, the new notion of the language network theory that really got um, solidified during the past 10 to 15 years. Uh, so um, one of the areas that I've been very interested in is um, looking at the physiology and anatomy of the language network using functional MRI. And then just to show you um, the basics for those of you who may not know this on, on a daily basis. Um, in functional MRI, you can do the, uh, the mapping either based on a task or looking at the connectivity of different areas of the brain at rest. In a task-based uh, fMRI, when the person is using certain areas of the brain, the blood flow to that area increases. That increases the oxygenated hemoglobin. It changes the magnetic field. And then based on that, we can see um, those areas that are activated by that task. And then in the bottom uh, diagram here, you see the ups and downs based on each of these uh, 
trials that the patient or the person is, is processing. And then when you average them, you see the areas that are involved in the task in orange and yellow maps that are uh, superimposed on the structural brain image. So this was first described by Ogawa in 1990. Since then, we've been really able to um, see what ha what's happening in the brain, not only in language, but you know, different cognitive functions. Um, and then I got involved in, in this area of research since about 2000, 2001, and we try to first figure out what's going on in, the, in this dorsal pathway. Um, just to show you, this is a task where the person has to name objects. With each naming, you see the hemodynamic response function goes up. And then when we average them, if, if they do uh, 20 of these items, we can average them and then we can look to see what areas are involved in processing of that task, for example, in this case, naming. And uh, so the work we, we did, we first started by looking at verbs and nouns. Those are the two very important components of our sentences. And verbs are important in sentence production and uh, making sentences and nouns to complete the sentences. We did not find any difference between them. As you see on the left top, blue and uh, green represent verbs and nouns, and then they, they, they overlap a lot. But when we looked at different types of verbs, things were different. And then we actually at that time thought that we found find localization in the broker's area because verbs are actually involved in sentence production. But then we found out that three different types of words, and then now uh, if you look at the, the bottom left picture here, there are verbs that only need one argument for the sentence to be grammatical, a verb like bark, the dog barks. There are verbs that need two arguments, the girl is tickling the boy, and then there are verbs that are, need three arguments, the mother is reading the book to the daughter. As the number of arguments increase and the actual semantic load of the verb increases, we found out that there's more activation in temporal parietal junction. This was very surprising at the time, but then shows you that processing of grammar and the planning of a sentence happens in posterior regions rather than anterior regions. So now we are really looking at networks rather than just regions in processing of language. Uh, when accumulated, our work really showed that uh, we, for the dorsal pathway that involves uh, grammatical processing, you have the involvement of the posterior temporal areas, the temporal parietal junction, and the broker's area. This network around the cilia and fissure they are all involved. Any area in, in these regions that you have a lesion, you may have a grammatism. It doesn't have to be necessarily in the front. However, you got to realize the connections between these areas through wide, wide matter is important too. If you're looking at stroke patients, you really have to take that into account. Is wide matter damaged? If so, it can affect the connectivity between these regions and produce a syndrome that may surprise you. Um, in 2010s, my a focus diverted to resting state functional fMRI and looking at the, the semantic network and then what happens in, in primary progressive aphasia. Just to give you a little bit of background, in resting state, we look at the oscillations in, in uh, blood oxygen. And if uh, there are two ways to look at this, uh, either with what's called the pairwise or node-based analysis. So you have one node here in the Broca's area, one in the Wernicke's area, blue and red so these have baseline oscillations as you see low frequency oscillations and if they correlate closely that means you know they are very likely connected to each other as you see in this picture and um, the other way to look at uh, brain connectivity is by using one seat and then asking the question of where else in the brain is this seat connected to what other voxels so then you see the ifg or the brokers see it here is connected to all these areas of the brain. So, so far as you uh, saw, you know, we were talking about the Broca's and Wernicke's area, but as you saw also, some of the semantic and lexical processing happens downstream in the temporal lobe. 
The temporal pole or anterior temporal lobe has uh, a very important function in processing of sp specific words or nouns and also in understanding of, of uh, words. Until 2012-13, really you know, um, a group of researchers thought that temporal pole is a amodal region of the brain. That is, it's invo it involves in, in many uh, cognitive processes, including semantics, object knowledge, and also language on both sides. But uh, this is a seminal paper led by Dr. Meslam that shows that uh, in patients with primary progressive aphasia who have atrophy in the left temporal pole, the, the um, deficit is really only linguistic. It's, it's only related to naming items and understanding words. So that means that um, the left is not really a modal. It is, it is really uh, involved in language, and then right is more involved in the object knowledge. Um, so the, the question was, okay, can we show this in the uh, brain anatomy? Is the temporal pole more connected to the left language areas compared to the right? So what I did is I, I created this net, uh, mesh work here uh, of these uh, equidistance spheres to look at the connectivity between those. And uh, th this is a data-driven approach. So we didn't really assume anything. We just looked at the connectivity between all these areas and then asked the question of which ones are more connected to others. And, and if the connectivity is more on the left side, then, then it's, it's very likely related to language. So what we found uh, was, of course, you know, you see the Broca's area, you see the Wernicke's area, which in, in functional imaging, we really find out that um, it's mostly um, located in the posterior middle temporal gyrus. This has been shown by many others, as you see in the bottom in the references. And then there's also the temporoparietal junction, and we also see the anterior temporal areas uh, having more connectivity. So we picked these four areas as the language related or um, questionable language related areas, and then we looked at the connectivity. We knew about the uh, anterior, uh, we, we knew about the IFG and about the, the MTG, middle temporal gyrus node. And then we asked the question of how are they connected to the temporal pole? And then we actually so, uh, showed that the connectivity between anterior temporal lobe to these two known area uh, regions of language processing is much more on the left side compared to the right side. As you see in the middle picture, the connectivity uh, coefficients are higher on the left than on the right. So then that kind of tells us that the anterior temporal lobe is part of the language network on the left side in right-handers. And then if you do actually a uh, um, independent component analysis, well, well, there is a completely unbiased approach uh, based on voxels of the brain. You see that they, there is a huge connectivity on the left, but not on the right, which shows uh, the importance of uh, connection between a lot of regions on the left side with the language network. Okay, so let me switch gears and then show you a little bit about uh, you know, language assessment and how things are a little different in, in primary progressive aphasia compared to what we do for stroke patients. So usually when we want to assess somebody who comes to us with, with some kind of communication problem, we, we start with, with na a naming battery, but we also want to rule out any speech problems like apraxial dysarthria. Usually um, people with uh, aphasia have some sort of naming problem, either word finding or expression of the word. So that will establish the diagnosis of um, aphasia and then also to confirm that you need to ask the patient to describe a, a picture. We are all very familiar with the cookie theft picture and we ask them questions uh, about, you know, understanding of sentences and words, and also a repetition. So these are really the components we check, and we've learned this in, in, in stroke aphasia. Uh, for PPA and in PPA research, we use Boston naming tests for, to check for naming. Um, for 
picture descri description, what we've been using is, has been mostly uh, Western aphasia battery picture description. There's also another uh, very well-defined way to do that using the Cinderella story, uh, which you can analyze the, the grammatical processing. For comprehension, we do the sentence uh, comprehension, but then there's also picture uh, and verbal matching. So uh, we look to see if by looking at a picture, the, uh, the person can match the words with it. So that helps with work to understand if patient can understand uh, the words. Single level word comprehension, that is impaired only in semantic type primary progressive aphasia, which is usually what we don't see in stroke aphasia. Uh, because the, the isolated temporal pole lesion is very rare, uh, uh, does not almost happen in, in, in stroke. And then repetition, we usually use the Western aphasia battery repetition subtest. For grammar measurement and for production measurements, we use two tests. One is a Northwestern assessment of verbs and sentences. So um, the person will look at the left picture here. The dog is chasing the cat. And then they, so this is a probe. And then they ask, they're asked to produce the sentence that describes the right picture. The cat is chasing the, the dog. And also there is another test developed at Northwestern called the Northwestern Anagram Test, which takes away the phonological working memory uh difficulty that these patients have. so they can actually work with these words that are on pieces of paper and they move them around to build a sentence the girl is tickling the boy so they move them and then they make the sentence that doesn't need any um auditory working memory component all right so a cookie theft, uh, you may or may not know, actually is very well studied over many, many years. And um, so we know this is based on years of work by uh, Dr. Nancy Helmist of Brooks and Dr. Marty Albert. Um, the cookie theft, in the average, people produce 18 uh, pieces of information, 18 phrases. And it can range from 13 to 24. So it's important to kind of know that and then to direct the patient to different areas of this literature to come up to see if they can come up with all these uh, content units, what's called. And then uh, a person with who is cognitively intact usually can produce a, a phrase or a sentence or an utterance, so-called, uh, that is about four to five words length. So if you uh, ask a cognitively intact person to describe this picture, this is how it looks like. A mother and two kids in the kitchen, the mother is washing dishes. So long grammatical sentences, about four to five uh, words, sometimes smaller, but uh, as you see, very detailed. So let's listen to uh, someone with primary progressive aphasia. Primary progressive aphasia is a neurodegenerative disease. It's an atypical form of Alzheimer's disease Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal degeneration. That means the, the syndrome starts with language involvement and no memory problem for 80 patients and no behavioral issues for uh, frontotemporal de uh, degeneration patients. It starts with language impairment, it gets progressively worse, and over time it actually involves other areas of cognition like attention, memory, and visual processing as well. In the agrammatic form, which involves, as you see, the, these are the areas of atrophy here in, in yellow and, and red. The uh, agrammatic form is usually called by, uh, caused by frontotemporal degeneration. And um, this is how they sound. Man, a boy, and a cookie is on them, and then it's 
daughter, another um, sister, and when she's going to throw her and all them, and they broke in a book on them, on them, store, on around by them, a lady, and she was having a washing on them, and they bit taps on them, and a drain on the floor, one there, horrible, a tile one there, and um, this man on the bed, maybe going, and they went on there, working out the window, maybe this little, little girl, look at someone there. So you see um, short sentences, uh, simple sentences, they're having difficulty with ver verb production, a lot of pauses that um, slows down the speech to below one, 100 words per minute. And usually in a cognitive intact, people have more than 150 words per minute. So these are, these individuals have difficult, that's why it's called non-fluent. And they can make uh, complicated sentences. They can't. Uh, so as, as I showed you, the, the, the three place verbs, the verbs that need three items to be grammatical, they have difficulty with using them. So that's how they almost look like Broca's area, uh, Broca's aphasia that we see in stroke. The logopenic type, they have mostly word finding difficulties. And they also have trouble with their repetition because of the dorsal pathway involvement they have a lot of pauses too but their pauses is not because of the fact that they can't make sentences it's because they have to pause to find the words so finding words is the high light of this one when you're ready what is he happening in that picture um i see mum washing drying some um Plate, cracky, um, with water running down. I see a young boy um, in the the other part of the the, um, the um, trying getting off. Um, well, only getting off. stool with his um, sister below so as you see uh, not much trouble with verb production but there's a lot of pauses long pauses for word finding Alzheimer's disease is usually the um, major um, underlying cause for logopenic aphasia and for those of you who see more dementia patients, Alzheimer's being the most common, um, even in the typical Alzheimer's disease that starts with memory problems, at some point you'll see they, they, they have word finding difficulties very commonly on top of the memory. The primary purpose of aphasia, the language and, and word finding comes first. You know, we see that very commonly in patients and then as almost most um, types of dementia, they, they get worse and they have word finding difficulties. You kind of hear uh, a pattern like this. And then the third subtype, which is an, again caused mostly by frontotemporal degeneration, um, is the semantic aphasia, uh, primary focus of semantic aphasia. And these individuals have difficulty with naming two, even worse than logopenic, very severe by the time they present. They also have trouble with word understanding. So if you tell them, show me uh, my show you show me your watch, they don't even understand what watch means. It sounds to them like a foreign language. And this is how they describe the cookie theft picture. What's going on in this picture? Oh, there is a woman touching her children. Um, Looking at the 
but it's a house, I suppose, and there's a little window from there, and I don't quite know what that is going down precisely. And then the children are Cooney Jar, I don't understand that quite either, what they're doing. And gosh, that one's foot is about to come off. <laughs> oh dear. It's <laughs> very good. And what's happening over this side of the picture? Is there anything going on out there? Well, there, well, there were loads of people all down the end, I suppose. Just that way. Or maybe not. Maybe it's buildings, maybe it's trees, etc. I don't know. Great. That's excellent. As you see, there are a lot of fillers, this, that, there, and uh, difficulty with word finding. But the sentences are long and grammatical in uh, semantic aphasia. Um, so just to give you um, a little bit of background on, on how we approach PPA patients, if you see them in, in your neck of the wood, uh, are first approach is to find out what the underlying cause is. Right now, clinically, only we can understand if they have Alzheimer's disease or not. So if uh, we get an amyloid PET scan or spinal fluid um, and then analyze it for, for amyloid and tau, if of course they have Alzheimer's disease, then th that confirms the uh, Alzheimer's disease as the underlying cause of primary progressive aphasia. Some agrammatics can also have Alzheimer's disease as well as the underlying cause. So that's very important because that can help us in terms of treatment. Um, right now, we, we haven't had any clinical trials uh, showing whether cholinesterase inhibitors that, like uh, the nepazil or galantamine that we use for Alzheimer, the typical Alzheimer's disease work for PPA. But, uh, uh, a paper that came out in 2019 by our group shows that there is a significant decline in cholinergic uh, innervation of the language network in these individuals. So unfortunately, we hit the pandemic, so we are kind of behind with clinical trials, but that's that will be the goal to figure out. But we, you know, clinically, we do use um, um, Alzheimer's medications in this group of PPA. For the um, frontotemporal degeneration disease, uh, we do not use those medications. In fact, a trial of, of mementine showed that in frontotemporal degeneration patients, these symptoms get worse. So we don't use especially the mementine. And, uh, and, and cholinesterase inhibitors really doesn't make sense because they don't have choliner, uh, cholinergic deficiency. Speech therapy is uh, a very important part of what we do for um, management of these patients. Um, over time, speech pathologists are getting more familiar uh, with treatment of PPA um, because, you know, speech pathology has been, you know, mostly focused on stroke aphasia and then PPA is, you know, we're learning more about it. But what we've been doing, you know, they are now at our center at uh, UCSF and also University of Texas. Austin, they are groups who work with these patients. Uh, they can now, you know, they had telehealth even before the pandemic, and then they have even more now. Uh, I, I refer them to um, those groups. We do have groups in, in Chicago who are actually very familiar with PPA. Uh, but if at certain regions, they are not uh, speech pathologists who may know about PPA, we try to get a menu from the experts and send it to local speech pathologists who can work with them. And if they get worse over time, we repeat the speech therapy. Um, and then, so this may you know, take for, for many years, the, the speech therapy approach. It, um, the results have been very significant, uh, better than any medication really. So it's very important to keep patients engaged and, and to have them work with the therapist. Question is, so what else can we do for these patients? And then, um, so I, my goal was to figure out if we can use neuromodulation um, to, uh, as an intervention for these individuals. Our understanding uh, of the anatomy and physiology of PPA back in 2012, 13, uh, was kind of limited. We, we were seeing patients, for example, the agromatic patients, when they come to us and we get an MRI, we may not see any atrophy in the beginning. 
we may or may not see changes in um, FDG PET scan. So the question was, what's happening to the connectivity uh, and functional MRI, what, would functional MRI help us understand what's going on in people who have less amount of atrophy? And what happens in people who do have atrophy and really what areas and what regions of the brain are involved in patient symptoms? So our first question was to see in people who didn't have any signs of atrophy, what's going on physiologically in the brain? We looked at, these were all agromatic patients. So we only looked at the Broca's area and Wernicke's area, IFG, MTG. And to have a comparison, we looked at the mesial part of the brain, the default network, the prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate cortex. There was no atrophy, as you see, compared to um, um, cognitively healthy individuals. And what we found was, of course, the connectivity between IFG and MTG was decreased in the PPA group, but the connectivity was not decreased in the default network um, regions. And then if you, so this was with the pairwise or node-based analysis. And then if we did the seed-based analysis, uh, we saw a significant decrease in connectivity uh, between IFG and the rest of the language network. And so we created this three node model or three seed model of, of language network, a simple model uh, based on the resting state work that we had done. And then we wanted to see in each of these subtypes what happens in terms of connectivity. What we found was, uh, so what you see in orange is decreased connectivity. In all subtypes, the connectivity between Broca's and Wernicke's or IFG and MTG's decrease. But in semantic type, on top of that, you see the ventral pathway also uh, showing decreased connectivity with uh, anterior temporal lobe. And then we showed that the IFG MTG connection which is really a representative of the dorsal pathway, correlates more with repetition and grammar. And the anterior temporal lobe and MTG co uh, co connectivity correlates with uh, naming and with word comprehension. So that would uh, distinguish between semantics and the two other ones. And then when we do the seed-based analysis, you see we can distinguish between the agrammatics and logopenics, with the agrammatics having a lot of decreased connectivity with IFG, as you see here, with Broca's, through uh, anterior frontal areas, the premotor and prefrontal areas. So how do we use these um, um, functional images uh, for treatment, to guide us with treatment. Uh, when I was a neurology resident in Arizona and uh, collaborating with the amazing team there, the physiology team there, who are really pioneers in treatment of PPA, uh, on the left side, you see we, this is a patient who had logopenic uh, aphasia. And uh, we scanned this person before treatment and after treatment. And then you see in the bottom, after treatment, there are areas especially in the frontal lobe, the executive areas that are activated uh, after patients went through a treatment that involved trying to describe the words that they couldn't uh, come up with. So uh, we could actually show that there was a, a reorganization in the brain. On the right side, you see some of the resting state uh, findings uh, using and the amplitude analysis of the resting state scans on, the, on, uh, on top, you see uh, that connectivity is decreased in blue in those areas, uh, or actually the amplitude of the connectivity is decreased. And then after treatment, you see that uh, this is a collaboration with the University of Texas Austin uh, and Dr. Maya Henry's group. Um, we saw that the amplitude increases in the Broca's area and the temporoparietal junction areas that are involved in grammar, they have atrophy in these areas, but also we saw uh, some increased activity on the right side in the right hemisphere as well. So function MRI can help as a biomarker, hopefully at some point. At this time, it's very difficult to use it at single subject level, but at group levels for clinical trials, we hopefully we can use it. The other thing, uh, 
uh, the other implication of understanding what's going on with the network is to use neuromodulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, something we wanted to start, but again, pandemic stopped us. We had a window we could bring in few patients to try this. And I got some of the results yesterday, and then we showed that, you know, we can actually uh, facilitate some of these networks. And then actually by community, this is a work with by Joe Voss and at Northwestern, who showed that if you, if you have many regions involved in a network and you don't have access to it, for example, in this case, hippocampus is very difficult to get access to with transcranial stimulation, but you can use areas that are connected to it and by stimulation of those areas, improve memory. So we are doing the same thing for language. And then, and then it's not just us, there are other groups at the University of Pennsylvania, at uh, Johns Hopkins, who are working on neuromodulation as well. All right. Um, I would like to summarize here for you, and then we can get to the questions. Uh, so for language network, we uh, talked about an evolving understanding of the language network, and then multimodal approaches use, using brain volumetric measurements, functional imaging, looking at the tracks, tractography. Now we are having better understanding of how syntax and phonology are processed through the dorsal pathway and semantics and lexical uh, processing is uh, processed through the ventral pathway. For pre-PA management, we talked about the three subtypes, non-fluent, agrammatic, semantic, and logopenic. We talked about uh, how to diagnose the underlying cause uh, we also talked about speech therapeutic approaches and uh, some ideas about pharmacological interventions. And um, based on our research now, we know that the connectivity between these areas involved in language processing is important to support syntax and also lexical semantic um, aspects of language. And uh, I, I'm very grateful of all the students and collaborators I've had during the past few years. These are my students in the past few years who've done a lot of the work and uh, all the amazing people I've worked with during the past many years. And I'm happy to take any questions. Dr. Bonagapur, thank you very much. It was. I mean, it was an amazing talk. You really, when you think about it, even historically, the language network was one of the first ones described as a cognitive network. And it seems for some time that we knew an atom of it and it was all settled. And the more we look at it, we, 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 understand, we understand that actually it's more complicated than that. Than, uh, uh, than that. So, and uh, yeah. obviously thank, you, thank you for all the work you're doing, you know, to, you know, uh, advance this um area uh we have several questions and let me i'm just gonna start pulling uh, some of them are about anatomy some of them are uh, uh, uh about the underlying diseases so let me i'm gonna pull the question so please explain how lesions in thalamus affect the language okay so that's a very good question so thalamus is connected to uh both the anterior and posterior areas of the brain so you have the thalamic strokes that you know on the left side and right handers can produce aphasia. And then most of the anterior thalamic areas can cause a non-fluent top and posterior can cause a fluent, but you know, probably with comprehension. And um, they usually tend to get better faster. They don't have much you know, trouble with repetition because the arcuate fasciculus um, connectivity is, is preserved in these patients. And so the, the approach to treatment is almost the same as, you know, the non-fluent and influent aphasias. And then there are different causes for it. You know, well, you know the hemorrhage, of course, is, is a big one. You know, I've seen infections causing abscesses in the thalamus. Um, in uh, frontotemporal degeneration of the TDP type, you see thalamic lesions too actually happening very early on. Uh, atrophy in the thalamus. So you can see that. And then the way to see that is, you know, you see the third ventricle is enlarged. So, um, yes, so that is also a part of so a lot of subcortical areas. That's a very good question, actually. Even though we are looking at also basal ganglia. Basal ganglia also supports all these areas as well. And we don't actually know much about it. 
And so we are really trying to um, understand what those subcortical regions do and contribute, how do they contribute. And in stroke, we have a lot of understanding of it, but in neurodegenerative disease, we are still working on it. Um, now, have you looked or are you aware of the pathways in stuttering? Um, this is, I'm just reading the question. I have often wondering if stuttering steps in Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's patients who stutter share related pathways. The, the stuttering in someone with... Uh, so if somebody with a Parkinson's neurogenic disease and in someone who has Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah, because uh, this is from our movement uh, disorder. Specialist. Yeah, yeah, so I think that is correct. So the, well, I mean, stuttering is a motor speech disorder. It's not an aphasia, of course. Um, you So you do have, uh, you're talking about the connectivity between the premotor prefrontal areas and also basal ganglia, which is very important, of course, in, in motor aspect of speech. So yes, um, with stuttering, however, the, with the stuttering without um, a neurogenic, you know, acquired neurogenic stuttering, um, you, you really have really no lesion in the brain. Um, but with, with Parkinson, yes, of course, you have the, uh, the damage to the dopaminergic system and the basal ganglia. So yes, there is there's some overlap. Um, can you elaborate more about left versus right temporal pole role in language as a whole? Yes, so that's a good question too. So I think based on the understanding we have by now, and even some of the groups that really thought about the a, a modality of a, a temporal pole, yeah, I think everybody agrees that the left anterior temporal lobe is more involved in, in language processing, in uh, specific naming, for example, not just animals, but specifically if, the, if somebody wants to say lion or tiger, we need the anterior temporal lobe on the left side. When there's atrophy there, patients have aphasia, anomia, and then they have also un uh, difficulty with understanding words. In semantic PPA, when the atrophy starts getting more widespread and includes the right hemisphere, people start having difficulty with also object knowledge. So a semantic PPA patient may not understand single words, or may have difficulty naming objects, but they can actually use objects. They can go to the kitchen and, and cook food. But by the time that the disease gets the right side, they can't understand what to do with objects. So object knowledge is gone as well. So in the beginning, it's only language. Later, it really affects uh, task accomplishment as well. Processing of faces also and recognition of specific phases. For example, when we have a test for famous faces, uh, we show people pictures of our presidents, um, actors, and understanding and, and recognizing faces re relies on the right anterior temporal lobe and right temporal pathway. So that's kind of the distinction between the two sides. Um, can you comment on language network anatomy in the, in the left-handers? In the left-hander, so the left-handers, the rule of thumb is that about 70% of them have left lateralized language processing, like right-handers, like 99% of right-handers. In about 15%, the localization of language is bilateral, left and right hemisphere, and then 15%, it's right lateralized, which is completely the mirror of, of what we see in right-handers. And you know that affects uh, their stroke, or even PPA uh, profile is different. They because if, if they have language distributed on both hemispheres, they may actually not have as much of a severe aphasia. So th that kind of changes the the presentation and also the recovery. Now this is uh, the question. This question is more pertaining to the logopenic subtypal PPA. Sure. Um, uh, do Alzheimer's disease biomarkers show that either amyloid or tau, abnormal tau, start accumulating in the language networks, or it's a normal distribution as this Yeah, that's a very, network. very good question again. Um, so there is a correlation between, of course, tangles and symptoms, as you know. And we see more involvement with, with, with tangles in the language network, in the, um, for example, the 
temporal parietal junction, than in hippocampus, and especially in the early stages of primary progressive aphasia. So there is actually, and then there is the, the form, pathologic form of Alzheimer's, as you know, just called hippocampal sparing. So yes, in the atypical forms of Alzheimer's disease, which are about 10% of Alzheimer's disease patients, you see the plaques and tangles start in areas that are outside limbic system, in language network in PPA, in the visual spatial areas, in, in posterior cortical atrophy, in the behavior variant, Alzheimer's disease in the frontal, frontal network and the frontal lobe, in the frontal type Alzheimer's disease in the frontal lobe. So um, that's how the atypical forms of Alzheimer's present. Okay. Um, there's a question about select, selective network vulnerability. Do we know why some people's language network becomes vulnerable to this type of pathology, either Alzheimer's or frontotemporal dementia? Yeah, that's again, very good question. So we do have some evidence, and then that's something that we always ask in the clinic. People who have more language difficulties might have had difficulty with language acquirement earlier in life. They might have had a learning disability or dyslexia. Not everybody, or they may have had actually a family history of learning disability or dyslexia. So that makes their language network more vulnerable. And if they are vulnerable also to Alzheimer's disease or frontal temporal degeneration, those diseases hit the networks that are weaker. And um, we actually had a paper that got published, I think last year in neurology, where we looked at a patient with primary progressive aphasia who had 10 diff other family members who had dyslexia. And we showed that um, in people with dyslexia, they, they even though they were okay, they didn't have aphasia, but they had decreased connectivity in the language areas. Okay. Now, um, the expansion of language network and atom obviously has uh, many implications, including in surgical world for the, for the surgeons, you know. Uh, are you involved in any pre-surgical patient evaluation, language evaluation or anything like that? Uh, unfortunately, I am not. I wish I could, but we have a, a, a very able neurosurgeon here at Northwestern, Dr. Matthew Tate, who knows a lot about language, about the language network, and um, he's done a lot of uh, very beautiful work with, you know, um, stimulating different areas. And of course, you know, with the eloquent cortex, cortex with which our, our neurosurgeon colleagues are, you know, very careful about, you know, they are areas that are really necessary for language processing, which is really the core Curry Sylvian areas. And they're areas that contribute, what, like, you know, you have the, the dorsal funnel or temporal junction. Uh, and so there are ways to really determine those before surgery with, you know, functional MRI. And then uh, during the surgery, also with stimulation and with intraoperative monitoring as well. Um, so Dr. Tate would be the best person to really get to the um, details of how that is done. Okay. You were talking a little bit about the uh, neuromodulation, about trans uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, is there a difference because, you know, the aphasia can be static as in stroke, you know, or can, can be progressive. Is there any difference in the response for these patients, you know, how they respond to the, to the neuromodulation? And there is was also a theory that possibility that neuromodulation in the progressive conditions might even questionably, you know, has to increase the progression because you're stimulating. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I mean, we, we don't always stimulate. Sometimes we inhibit. For example, mm -hmm. in, in stroke aphasias, in, in some forms of stroke aphasias, the, in the, the problem is overactivation of the right hemisphere. So mm -hmm. you really want to calm the right hemisphere down. Uh, in terms of whether it can, you know, I, I, I would say I, I don't know if, uh, or I haven't seen a paper that would su suggest, I mean, if, if it makes it worse, I would say people wouldn't do the the, the interventions, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, the difference between neurodegenerative and, and stroke aphasias is also that by the time we see patients, it doesn't really uh, mean that they don't have pathology in the right hemisphere. Okay. So people who have, you know, Alzheimer type PPA or frontal temporal degeneration type PPA, they do have stuff going on in the right hemisphere as well. So that kind of makes their response different than uh, in stroke. In stroke, you have usually in the right hemisphere that's mostly intact. Okay. So that kind of gives them a benefit. 
And uh, we have more questions, but I, I think we have time only for one more. Um, how often does onset of PPA coincide with new onset seizures? Would this cause you to do different diagnostics prior to settling on the diagnosis, uh, other than the period of a continuous CEG, et cetera? Can you, um, can you repeat the question, please? How often does the onset of PPA coincide with new onset seizures? Seizures? Yes. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, we don't see that many patients who have seizures. We do see patients with dementia and, and, and seizure disorders. Some people think there is something about seizures and neurodegenerative disease. Some groups don't even believe in it. So I don't know really how to answer the question. Sure, sure. Dr. Bernard Kapoor, thank you very much. As you can tell, the, the, uh, the talk really generated a lot of interest. And uh, again, thanks for doing all the work you're doing to, you know, to, for us to understand better the language and you know, the, lang the language network. Um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, would like to, you know, there are some other comments and there are many comments for, you know, thanking for the talk and uh, asking when uh, we're gonna have meaningful treatments, cures for these horrible conditions. And I'm sure your group is working on that as well. Um, and for all the, uh, uh, for, uh, for all our listeners, I would like to thank you for joining today. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much.